here. Okay, so we're on session 11. We're going to be going through the uh, mining application, going through uh, all the different elements. You know, just again, reiterate this idea of the application. Sometimes you think about, well, we're just, you know, filling out this little application and get submitted. But here, here's kind of how you need to think about this. It is probably one of the most critical areas in the best utilization and management of your um, priorities time. Uh, because if you get this right and you are appropriately vetting uh, the client, the deal, economics, uh, you're going to nail it. If you don't, and you're lackadaisical in this area, you don't, or you bypass go, then you're going to deal with lots of frustrations. So this is designed to literally create a discipline to make sure that you're becoming a really good investor, so to speak, in the way that you size up deals and the way you size up people, the way you size up transactions um, and the economics that go into it. So um, when we talk about asset and loan type, um, what do you think we're trying to get at on the loan type and the asset type? Figuring I mean, out the risks. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're trying to figure out what are the, what type of asset is it? And then what are the kind of risks that could be associated with that asset type? So if I say to you hotel, uh, is there anything that you would want to kind of know about a hotel that would be important? Location. Location is huge, obviously. That's a big one. Amenities. Amenities is a big deal. You know, so location matters. Amenities, is it full service, limited service, right? Does it have all these amenities with conference rooms and and things like that, or is it just kind of like a limited service hotel? What brand is it? Okay, is it a Hilton, Marriott, you know, um, Choice? You know, you're kind of just trying to figure out all those things. And then, um, you know, you really want to start looking at, you know, what is the average rent roll uh, that it deals? You want to look at, you know, what point in the economy are we in? You know, I mean, we're going into a recession. So if I'm thinking about hotels, what are people going to start doing less of? Traveling. Traveling. You're going to eventually go, well, you know, we don't have to go do that. That would be nice. Um, now, maybe they do something like a staycation. So who knows if localized, that'll stabilize. But still, they're going to be questioning, should I do that? Is that really necessary? Um, and, you know, one of the first things that's going to squeeze is the travel industry. Okay. So you need to think about those things, you know, um, in apartments, you know, is it individually metered, master metered, you know, um, what's the condition of the property, you know, self-storage, um, you know, industrial, retail. If I'm thinking of retail, what do you think I'm thinking? Um, I think... Look, location matters because you want a lot of foot traffic um, within that area. And then you kind of also want an anchor tenant to kind of draw in other customers. So like yeah. a big short kind of thing. Exactly. So anchor tenant, location, visibility. The other thing too is going to be who are the tenants? Who are the tenants? Is it a mortgage company that just lost half their revenue? and they're gonna shut down, you know, who are those tenants and what's gonna happen if, you know, something comes up to affect their industry. So you're gonna ask those kinds of questions about who are the tenants in there? How are they doing? How many locations do they have? Is it a corporate lease or is it an individual lease? Do they have multiple locations? Do they have one location? How are they doing in their sales if they are an anchor tenant? When does their lease come up? I mean, you're just trying to size up and go, is this thing on the verge of, you know, getting in trouble? 
Um, so things that you want to be aware of, okay? Now we ask about cash flow. What are we trying to find out on cash flow? Like the consistency of, you know, like, are they making payments? Are they, make, are they filling rent? How is their revenue in store? How much are they selling? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what is the stream of the cash flow that's coming in and can we rely on it? Uh, will it cover the debt service? Historically, can I look back and see that it has? Or am I just relying on the future? Um, it, did they do really well in COVID and that's going to eventually peel back? I mean, take a really good look at Peloton. I mean, Peloton just absolutely killed it during COVID, right? You're locked up in your house. You got your Peloton, right? And you're just, you know, you know they're just killing it. But as soon as things level out, Right, people could go back to the gym. Like Peloton was not as sexy, and so you saw like them just lay off tons of people. Yeah. Right. They also they hired that new CEO, right, and then he brought in like a subscription type service. Right. And that revived their whole business model again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, there's all the there's all these different things you have to look at and say to yourself, what is it that uh, is going on with each tenant and company and how will that be impacted by what's going on now and where we're going and we just have to be aware of that on the cash flow and make sure you feel comfortable and confident with the cash flow that is in place but not just what's in place historically i'm more worried about where is it going in the future because you know things change fast okay so on the cash flow, remember we're looking for debt service coverage ratio. Uh, if it's projection based, you want to make sure their projections are in store. Um, we're working on a project right now. There's a couple of ones, 11 million, the other ones about nine, and it's uh, you know the expenses are light. So we're like asking, man, why are those expenses so light? You know, can you really operate that way? Asking lots of questions. Okay. Uh, collateral, um, pretty straightforward. Uh, you're just trying to find out what is the collateral uh, that we are going to be taking as a lien uh, and what is the condition of the collateral. So what do you think I mean by collateral? Maybe that's a good place to start. Like what is your backing if the deal were to fall off? Like what is the real estate worth? Do you have like a trust, um, personal income? Yeah, the collateral is the tangible thing that I can secure <clears throat> as a secondary source of repayment that if I have to liquidate, that I can, you know, dispose of it. And, you know, what is it worth? If I'm dealing with equipment, Equipment depreciates a lot faster than real estate, so it could lose its value quicker um, versus just, you know, a piece of real estate, a land or a building. So you want to know what is the collateral, what's the condition, what's it worth, and how did you come to that conclusion? Right. I have a quick question going yeah. back to asset and loan types. Can you talk a little, little bit more about factoring? Yeah. I really understand that part. So fact, so I want you to think about this. So let's just walk through a scenario for a minute. So I um, sell you a, uh, a widget, okay? And I sell you the widget for a million bucks. And you buy the widget for a million bucks. And you say to me, okay, you know, I'll give you a 10% now and I'll pay you the rest over the next 90 days. Okay, so you give me a hundred grand up front, and then I carry a receivable on my books. Okay, so now on my balance sheet, if you look at my balance sheet, it says accounts receivable. 
Mm -hmm. And on that accounts receivable, it says 900,000 bucks. Well, you know, there's a factoring report that my CPA can run that will say, you know, that I have a, you know, accounts receivable and I'm supposed to get paid in the next 30 days. Okay. So what happens is I say, well, that's great that I just made that sell, but you know, it doesn't mean a hill of beans unless I have cash. So I might say I need cash now. And so uh, I go out to companies who specialize in factoring. So what they'll do is they will go out and say to me, they'll say, okay, Mr. Cotter, we will take a lien interest against that receivable and uh, we will lend you 80% of that outstanding amount. So if you guys take 900,000 and you multiply it by 80, what is that? Seven twenty. Yeah. So they'll say to me, okay. Uh, so, you know, they'll say to me, so let's just say that Zach, Zach says, I'll give you 720,000 bucks, Dave. And you're going to pay me, um, 19% interest on that money. And I'm only going to give you 80% because you know, there might be a chance of some default, maybe he doesn't give you the whole thing. So I'm only going to give you this amount. And so that what happens is I get that and I'm paying interest against that cash I just got against my receivable. And then when the money comes in from you, then I go pay that loan off and I get my excess cash. Gotcha. So that's what's factored. Okay. So it's just basically you're receiving a loan for your accounts receivable that you don't want to wait for. Exactly. It's, it's managing cash flow. Got you. Yeah. That's all you're doing. You're saying, I'm going to turn this receivable into cash so that I can really operate my business. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's a great business. Uh, a couple of my guys, one of them in particular does uh, a decent amount of them and uh, they close fast like most real estate deals take like 60 to 90 days. You can close a factoring deal in less than a week. And they actually pay residual. So he, every month he just gets checks, mm -hmm. them, right? So it's, it's an interesting business for sure. So do they just have a ton of capital at hand just to dispose to help? Correct, yeah. It's just kind of a perpetuity thing. Well, until they go away. Uh, good question. How are we compensated? What do you think? Do you guys remember how we're, we're paid? Um, through fees for closing loans. Yeah. Providing, you know, our valuable service. So who's, who, who are we charging that to? The borrower. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, we're going to have this conversation pretty early on in the, uh, cycle. And why do you think we're going to have the discussion around our fee uh, in pretty early? Well, they know before you go through with it. Yeah. One, one of the reasons why is because we are going to, um, you know, I'm trying to bet people out. And I want to have the discussion early just to be up front. And I also want to hear their perspective. So what do you think the different kinds of perspectives are when I talk about money with people? What do you think? I mean, obviously some people are not going to be willing to pay the fee. That's right. Some people <laughs> say, I wouldn't pay that in a million years. <laughs> and how, how much more time do you think we're going to spend together? Not a lot. Yeah. Not a lot of time. And I say, understood, respect that, probably best if we part ways, right? Um, the second group is what I call the haggler, right? They just want to haggle, you know, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. 
and I call them over negotiators and they can't stop like just negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. Those are also people that I'm trying to avoid because they can't help themselves. They just can't stop. So everywhere along the way at every step, they're constantly just, just hammering. Okay. Um, and so, you know, why do you think we avoid those kinds of people? Because they're probably going to argue for something that's really just not worth it. And like, if they just keep doing it and you get to the end of the deal, you, you'll, you will have wasted so much time just for them to argue about half a percentage point or. Yeah. They're trying to get the best deal that they can. Yeah. Which look, I say, Hey, look, you know, God bless you. But at the end of the day, um, you know, they don't see value in what you're doing. All they see is I just am price, 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 price. And you're like, okay, at some point, you know, you just go, this is unhealthy. <laughs> um, you don't see anything but dollars. And that's just not a good relationship. So that's the one we avoid. Uh, and then obviously, then there's kind of where we try to handle, which is, hey, this person's going to negotiate. That's all normal, but they're fair. Okay, and this is reasonable, fair, it's back and forth. And we put it, put a bow on it, we're done. Don't need to revisit it a thousand times. Okay. So those are the kinds of people. But what you're doing is you're just starting to understand, do I want to work with this person? Do they see value in what I have to offer? And what we're trying to do is it's kind of like dating. You know, you go have your cup of coffee and you get done with your cup of coffee and go, do I want to go on another date? <laughs> or do you say, I don't want to go on another date? It's like I went on a date when I was single and somebody set me up and I remember going out on the date. We were waiting in line to get a coffee. And I said, well, what do you like to do for fun? And she said, well, I like to take naps. And she said, I sleep 10 hours a day. And then, you know, I'll take a nap for an hour at lunch. And, and uh, at first I thought she was kidding. And then after about 10 minutes, I realized she was serious. And uh, I was able to wrap up the coffee in about 20 minutes, right? Because we just weren't going to go anywhere. Because <laughs> uh, I don't I like to do things, you know, not nap all the time. So, okay. you know, so we just, you know, you're dating here, trying to figure out, you know, do I want to work with this person? And do they want to work with me? You know, and one of the ways we do that is by talking about money. And most people get weirded out by talking about money. We love to talk about it and we wanna talk about it up front, okay? So nobody gets surprised <clears throat> at the end. And then it says setting clear expectations. Um, what kinds of things are involved in that? Uh, fees, timelines, interest rate. Yeah, exactly. Like one of the things outside of the fee I'm trying to find out is, do you live in a world that will align with reality? Okay. If you say to me, I need to close in 15 days and I'm like, okay, well you can, but it's hard money. <laughs> like, well, I don't want to pay hard money. I'm like, okay, well, nobody's going to close in 15 days. So what are we going to do? Right? So I'm always just trying to press on those things like timing, loan to value, interest rate, you know, things that move the needle. And then we try to see, do, will, will they align with what reality is? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to identify with people, just setting expectations because you're managing people's expectations all throughout the process. Um, and so that's what we're going for. Uh, recourse versus non-recourse. We've talked about that one before, right? Uh, same thing. I might say to them, you know, what's your expectation around recourse? I need non-recourse. Probably not going to happen. Uh, on this particular deal, 
uh, or it will if you do X, what would you like to do? And again, another point of saying, are we aligned or are we going to part ways? Okay. Um, so we need to ask that question. Um, client loyalty. What is, what are we talking about? We're talking about loyalty. <clears throat> like I'm trying to gauge how loyal they are, like not only just to you, to and people in general, uh, to kind of get a gauge of like, are they going to stick with you? Are they going to dip on you last minute? Um, are they going to pay you back? Um, do they kind of see the value that we're providing to them? Yes. And you're trying to say, am I going to really get a fair shot at the deal? <clears throat> or are you shop in the world? Um, are you just going to keep looking for the next best thing every time you turn around? You know, it, it's, it's super important that you have a discerning element to see is the client really loyal uh, in the sense of how they're trying to respond to you. And if you get the sense that they're just like, hey, dude, I'm shopping everybody. Um, you kind of go, hey, you know, things don't work out, come back. But, you know, don't, I'm probably not going to do that with you. Okay. So um, if you were to, if you were to like sit down with someone for like a lunch and talk about it, how would in your eyes like see if, um, if you knew that they would be loyal to you? Yeah, it's a great question. This is how I would ask, uh, you know, I would say something to the tune of like, hey, um, you know, how, tell me kind of how you've done deals in the past. Like, do you have some banks you like to work with? How do you like to function? How do you typically approach it? It's a good way for me to find out, you know, they'll tell you, hey, man, I just go wherever I need to. It doesn't matter. I'm just shopping for the best deal. You know, whoever has the best, I'm going with them, right? Versus somebody says, hey, you know, I've done most of my stuff with this bank. I really like them, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's one of the ways that I would do that. You know, uh, what's your approach to working with different lenders? Um, you know, so I might do it in that sense, what it sounds like, right, in a real life conversation. And then by listening to them, you'll find out how they perceive and look at things. And it'll either be something you'll go, okay, I think I'm going to get a fair shot at the deal or they're shopping like crazy. Do you like potentially try to reach out to people that like you may know that they also know to kind of like get a gauge of like, I don't know who they are as a person and kind of- Yeah, work. yeah, yeah. If I do, if I have, if, if I have a sense, right, then I might look around, I might start asking some questions of people if I, or if I'm questioning things, you know, sometimes I'll even hop on the line um, I did this with a guy who's interviewing, who's going to do, be, be doing some consulting or wanted to do consulting with us on our fund that we're starting. And, you know, I went home and he said something in the, the interview that just made me kind of go. And so I did some research and found out, you know, he's got, you know, some SEC, SEC fraud violation stuff and things like that. Um, you know, so which, Again, you know, he can be transparent about it, um, but, you know, I needed to know, you know, because I, I don't want to hitch my wagon to him, not because I don't think he, you know, who knows if it was accurate or not, but it's just not good, you know, PR. <laughs> if I'm raising money and all of a sudden the guy that's consulting me had fraud, right? So you're just, you're always trying to, you know, I interviewed one guy and I got a phone. I was like, man, something doesn't seem, seem right hopped online, did some research, found he got kicked out of the state for groping somebody in a bar, you know, just stuff like that. But I'm like, you know, probably not going to work with you, you know? So, um, so yes, I always try to do research on people if they didn't come recommended, right? If they came recommended from somebody, I'm always going to ask that person, this person did come recommended. And I just did research and went back to the guy that recommended and said, Hey, do you know about this? Right. And he's like, no, I didn't. I'm like, well, you might want to be aware. So yeah. yeah. Definitely do your research because um, you know, again, not that not that if somebody has a past, not you just automatically write them off. But 
you definitely sure. want you want to know about it. Uh, urgency. What are we doing with urgency? What is that all about? Clients motivation, I guess. Let me tell you, this is probably the number one thing I'm looking for, of whether I'm going to spend time on a deal. Um, because here's the thing. If you work with a client and there is urgency there, means they got to get this deal done, then it's like a freight train. And it doesn't matter what bumps and bruises you go through the deal, they're motivated. But if I have somebody that's kind of like, we'll be nice to get done, but I don't have to, I, you know, I'm, I'm leery because we're just going to run through bumps and bruises. And if they're not that motivated, those guys, ah, I don't care. Walk away. Does that make sense? Or I'm going to, I can unpack that a little bit more. No, I agree with me. Say that again. Sorry. I, oh yeah. No, I, I totally get what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like if you, you if someone's under contract, they're coming out of a 1031 exchange, you know, they've they've put tons of time and money into a development. We just did this on a deal and like we ran into some serious issues, like you know, back and forth negotiations, but they were motivated, they were committed. They're just like, no, we're gonna get it done. And it got done. But I've had other people and historically that <laughs> I mean, they just they ran into one bump and they're just like, yeah, forget it, I don't care. It's like, oh my gosh. Not doing that again. So definitely you want to press into that one. And if you find out some, it'd be nice to get that, but I don't have to. That's immediately you're just like, yeah, not going to do it. Uh, understanding credit. So again, what are we looking for in credit? Um, kind of like what someone's understanding about it is kind of, um, do they understand how the whole credit idea works? Um, are they competent about it? Um, like what do their financial statements look like? Are they strong? Are they liquid um, in case a deal does go bad? Um, yeah, I mean, if they don't have any competent, competence about the deal, like are they partnered up with somebody who may have experience within the industry? Um, yeah, what we're focusing on on the credit side is really going to be around, do they have any history with respect to bankruptcies, foreclosures, short sales, um, any of those areas that you need to press into in order to identify whether this is gonna be a problem. Now, this is not black and white, it's very gray because I have some of the best clients and they had bankruptcies, okay? Uh, doesn't mean they were a bad person, it just means they got into a tough time. And so, but if they have a good story that they worked through it and there was character behind it, that's good. Somebody says, totally walked away from it and told the lender to screw it, screw themselves. I don't care. It's like, well, okay. Character. Right. So we're like, you know, the guys you're talking about who may have had like bankruptcies were a lot of those due to like the recessions or completely different. Yep. You know, got an 08. You know, look, it was just a, it's like kind of like saying, hey, um, there was a little bit of a storm on the beach. And people were like, well, I could kind of maneuver and get out of that versus like, no, we had a tsunami come through. <laughs> and even the most solid foundation just got ripped under. Yeah. You know, and it's like, hey, dude, you're in a tsunami. You did everything you tried to do to stay on solid ground, but you just got racked. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, you know, I have guys that, I mean, I have one client. He has literally built a whole new business and he's selling all of his projects just to pay back his investors back from 08, 09. Oh, really? Well, that's a guy with integrity, right? Like that's, that's, that's the kind of person I want to work with <laughs> um, because, you just, you know, that's the kind of person that they you will know, stand behind their work, right? Um, so we're looking for those kinds of people that just have integrity. They're not perfect, but they have integrity, right? So uh, client credibility, what are we talking about when we're dealing with credibility? If the clients are competent. Yeah, it's just competence, right? And again, when you think about competence, you know, 
even if somebody you said this on the the last one, uh, Ben, but you know, yeah. someone might not have done this their whole life, but maybe they hired a bunch of people with them that did, and they've developed a team of competence around them. Okay, um, so either way doesn't matter, but do they have a team that is competent to pull off what they need to do? And can we sell that? If they have no experience, do they have like kind experience? You know, maybe somebody was in the medical field, but then they transferred to a different medical field, but they have like kind experience that they can justify why they did it, okay? So you just wanna be able to sort of walk through that with people. Okay. Uh, client net worth. What are we looking for here? Your assets minus your liabilities. Yeah. Yeah. Look, here's the deal. If you deal with banks, they're not as concerned about net worth. So some of it depends on the type of lender you're going to partner with that will drive and dictate what this number needs to be. Because if you were the life company, they'll say you need one and a half times. If you were the bank, they go, I don't really care. I just want a lot of cash. If you're with a REIT, like we're doing a big project with a REIT right now, and he's like, I need three times net worth, right? Um, and certain amount of percentage liquidity. So every lender is gonna be different. So you kind of have to go in and understand where do I think they're going to go? So you can consult them on that. I've got one guy, he's newer, but he's done a ton of projects, but he's newer trying to get into larger deals. And him and I have been journeying for the last two months and I keep consulting him. I'm like, look, your net worth, you've got to have a net worth of one and a half times or one times and seven and 10% in liquidity. Once you get there, come back to me because I can't help you, right? So it's just, and he did, and he got it done. Um, but, you know, that's part of the deal. Are those gonna be recourse deals? Like, is that why they're asking? It, well, it's a great question. I would say uh, both. Sometimes even if it's non-recourse, lenders still wanna see you've got a good net worth. Mm -hmm. You know, because from their perspective, they're kind of going like, look, if I'm going to do non-recourse, I want to do it to somebody that has some worth and competency because they didn't get there because they're an idiot. <laughs> they yeah. got there because they're smart and I want to lend to smart people. Okay. Um, and so that's, that's kind of their, you know, mentality. So, it, but you know, either which one, you know, sometimes it's like, Hey, we're going to start off on recourse. We're going to burn it off over time. And, uh, and so we need to start somewhere, okay? Um, property location, talked about this a little bit. Uh, this is a really big deal. You know, I'm working on a deal in Las Colinas right now. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a big, big project. But, you know, as soon as I say Las Colinas, people are like, oh yeah, it's a great location. Depends on where you're at, but you know, clean, but you know, where it's located, they're like, you know, it's great. You know, if I say rock wall, you know, people are like, oh, it's, it's great. You know, um, but if I say Midland, you're kind of like, well, I don't know, you know. Well, there's an oil boom coming. Yeah, it just depends on where you're out of the cycle. So, you know, you need to be able to Understand that if you're dealing in tertiary submarkets, that you're going to lose a lot of lenders. Okay. Because they just go, we don't want to be in smaller markets. Um, and quite frankly, if you're in a recession, uh, I tell my guys, I said, don't look at stuff in smaller markets because as soon as recession comes, they just go, you know, because it just gets tougher. You know, there's just not as much market. Um, asset, property, business description. Um, you, you need to think about like continually explaining everything you possibly can about the property, the asset, 
uh, the condition, um, you know, everything you can, because then when they get it, they don't have questions to go like, well, what's the size? How many units? What's the unit mix? Does it have garages? Do they have amenities? You know, um, you know, what's the square footage of the land? Um, what's the ingress, egress? All these little things you want to describe in your description of the property so people can go, okay, I've got everything I need to make a decision. Because part of this is like when you're delivering it to the lender, you want to be able to give them everything so they can quickly make a decision and get back to you. But if you give them a bunch of dismattered stuff and they have to sift through things, where do you think you're going to fall on the priority? <laughs> Bottom of the pile. They're just like, ah, that's too much headache. But if I give them a nice, simple one page thing they can look at in an email and just go boom, 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 boom. And they just go, yep, we like it. Let's go. Or they'll go, nope, not our deal. Because you kind of think, well, I need to send this huge thing to the lender and they'll love it. But these guys don't. They're just like, dude, give me all the stuff I need in order to make a decision. And I just want to move on. Okay. Uh, value of the property. Why do you think that matters? Because if the loan were to go to bad, um, you could have, I mean, it's kind of a form of collateral at the same time. It's in a gray area. Yeah. A lot of traffic. Yeah. Yeah. You come and tell me it's worth this. I need to verify that. I need to call commercial brokers. I need to know, give me comps. How did you come up with that conclusion? And if I can get convinced then myself, then I'm not concerned about when we go get an appraisal. But if I'm having a tough time coming up with the value you told me, then that means so is the appraiser. So you need to do your homework when you're doing this, okay? Also, quick question on the back one. What was the difference between agress and egress? It was either agress or ingress. Yeah, ingress, egress. Ingress uh, is coming into the property. Egress is going out. Okay. So it's just, it's access points to property. I mean, mm -hmm. think about how many times like you go up and you're like, gosh, I got to flip a UE to get back in there. And if you're feeling lazy, <laughs> what do you do? You're like, ah, it's not going to go. Wow. <laughs> right? So unfortunately, we live in that kind of environment where you just better make it really easy for a customer to do business. And if you don't, you could be losing clients just because of that, just because they can't get in, you know? Um, so ingress, egress becomes a really big deal. Like how do I get in and out of the property? Because that'll dictate the value. Could, could dictate. Um, are they looking to sell? Why am I asking this question? They could get prepayment penalties at the end of the day for paying early if they were to sell and it's not really worth the time. The yeah, that could, that could be, that's right. That could be a potential, but I'm listening to them. I'm saying if I go, if somebody comes in and they're going to refinance property and they say to me, I ask them, do you think about selling? Um, sometimes I've actually had it. This is why each one of these questions has a story to them of pain. Um, I have had a client go all the way down to close and they had listed the property for sale and I didn't know about it. And then they sold it right under me at the very last minute. <laughs> and they go, hey, I'm sorry, I just sold the property. And I'm like, seriously? Uh, and so just asking that question, hey, are you thinking about selling the property? <laughs> Could save you hours and hours of brain damage. 
Um, so seems silly, but you'd be surprised about how many times I ask the question, they go, yeah, I actually do have it listed for sale. And I just immediately say, you know, probably a timeout for us. So, you know, so have they ordered a phase one? Why do I want to know that? And this is specifically on a refinance. You want to see if the property is any containments or financial hazards. Um, if that's not done, it can drastically affect, affect the value of the property. And then if you end up having to get a phase two, it's very costly. Extremely expensive. And I have had people buy a property, never get a phase one, go ahead and find out they have tanks under there, gas tanks, and now they're in big trouble because it's leaking. The EPA has to get involved. It's expensive. So for some reason, they either were poorly advised by somebody uh, or they were, you know, sort of um, penny wise, pound foolish, as they say. Right. They're like, oh, I don't want to spend money for that. It's like you could have spent three grand to save yourself 400 grand. So probably not a good decision. So we always, if somebody hasn't gotten one and they own the property, we stop and we say, we're gonna order a phase one before we go any further because we just don't wanna go through this whole journey, okay? Um, and then construction and development questions. Do you guys remember some of the questions you ask in construction? Yeah, like who owns the land? Why did they buy it? What is like the zoning or rezoning? What's the deal with that? Um, is there like access to water? I know utilities approval is one, like I kind of understand that. We'll probably need a more in depth explanation. Is that just like, are they allowed to like have the utilities there or? Yeah, or just, you know, again, do they have utilities pulled up to the site? Do they have to pull utilities up to the site? Meaning, do they have Cox cable? Do they have sewer up to the site? Do they have water? Um, if not, they have to pull that in. That gets really expensive, you know, sure. if all of a sudden they don't, if they already have it stubbed up to the site <clears throat> utilities, then that will save them a lot of um, headache, you know. Um, and so, you know, water uh, is obviously huge. What is the water? How much water do they have? Um, you know, what's the entitlement process they're in right now? Do they have rezoning already in there? Um, you know, so all those things come into play. So what, what's an ALT-A study? Uh, it's a um, ALTA survey, which is basically, uh, I think it's American Land Title Association. What it is, is it's, it's a survey. You ever seen those guys on a site where they have a, you know, these three like stools and they'll see them like, with a little scope. And then there's another person all at the end with another yeah. scope. Uh, so what they're doing is they are, they are mapping out the uh, property lines to see exactly where are the exact property lines. Uh, they're gonna show you where all of the um, utility lines are under there. Uh, encroachments, easements, all those things, so that when you buy it, you really know exactly what you're buying. And uh, so it's the ALT a survey is really important. Now, the title companies, typically the person is going to drive that, whether you get one or not, because you might need extra insurance and they say, hey, we're not going to give you extra insurance unless you get an ALTA survey. Okay. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So I might even have, I even have an ALTA survey. Yeah, like here's a example of one. You guys see that? 
Oops. That was weird. It's telling me I have to sign into this silly browser. Okay. Pull this up. All right, you see that? Yeah. So this is kind of the, you know, if you look at it, you go, okay, there's the APN number. These are the coordinates, tells you exactly what they are. What's the APN number? Huh? What's the APN number? So this is the assessor's parcel number. Oh, okay. So like so in your county, they're going to give you a certain APN number. Okay. Um, and then here they'll start to tell you, you know, easement line. See this right here. Here's all the easement lines. You know, center line section, adjacent property line. So it's going to start to, you know, tell you where there's a power pole, lights, signs, fire hydrants. You know, so you get to go through and see all these things. Okay. Yeah. So. Just kind of, uh, you know, important. If I'm owning a property, I'm kind of looking to always protect my interests. And you just definitely don't want to skimp on something if, if, um, if you don't have to. Um, personal questions. You know, sometimes you're going to have to get personal with people. Like you're going to have to ask them things that might seem uncomfortable. Like, hey, you going through any divorces right now? And you know, are you in any lawsuits? Is there anything I should know of? Um, sometimes people go, hey, I'm just going to be honest, I'm going through a divorce. And it, it seems a little awkward, but you're going to have to say, hey, look, I'm sorry. Uh, that's, that's tough. But, you know, we need to kind of know <clears throat> what's going on because if we get to the end and your bride, who you're, you know, is not going to sign, then we just have to address that up front. You know, and I've had to be on the phone late at night sometimes with wives and, you know, kind of talking them through things. It just, you know, um, sometimes it feels a little awkward, uh, but, you know, that's just part of being big boy and having big boy discussions that they, you know, just part of the deal. So, um, so you have to be willing to have those conversations and be empathetic uh, you know, about things, you don't want to just be, you know, kind of the stoic guy, but, you know, you also need to be the one that kind of moves it along. I've had one guy and say, it'll be fine. No issues at all. And I said, no, I understand that. I said, but I'm going to need your wife to actually sign this and say that she will sign the documents at the end. Uh, otherwise we're going to have to hit the pause because you just, you know, you know, I think everybody has good intentions, but if you're going through divorce, it means not everybody's happy. <laughs> so just, you know, it's sort of a reality. Um, so collecting documents, uh, we need to collect documents and you're also going to need to um, realize that if someone's not giving you what you need and they're dragging their feet, that's a good sign that you have somebody that has a lot of urgency, okay? Um, it's just an, an uh, indicator to you that someone's not that motivated. You know, if they just, if you're having a tough time having to drag things out of people, that just tells you kind of like, you know, this isn't a priority for you. And so therefore it shouldn't be a priority for you, us. Um, again, we don't have to be rude, but it's just, you need to move on, okay? So that's kind of it. I did, there's not a whole lot more I need to talk about there. Um, I do wanna move us on to lesson five, loan program education mind center. So I do want you to go through those and get as far as you can. You know, 504, 7A program, Freddie Mac, Life Company. Um, 
try to knock out as many of those as you can between now and Thursday. Um, and uh, or I think it's Wednesday, right? Yeah, Wednesday. Um, between yeah. now and Wednesday, try to go through as many as you can. And what we'll do is we will um, we'll just start walking through this. A little bit more of a deep dive, but the products matter because when you're having a conversation with a, with a borrower, if you can't understand the programs, you can't really consult because then they're kind of like, well, what do you think? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> Seems cool. It's like, well, I want you to kind of help me. So, you know, you got to understand your programs, what's available. Okay. So guys, thank you for your hard work. Uh, thanks for being flexible with me last week. Uh, just with my travel schedule gets kind of crazy sometimes. And, uh, um, but uh, you guys are clipping along. Hopefully you're learning some things, um, gaining some knowledge. Uh, do you feel like you've been learning a little bit more? Has this kind of been helpful to you? Yeah, definitely. Good. 